Welcome to the Visual Effects Notes podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by F-Track and Action VFX. F-Track is an Academy Award-winning project management, production tracking, and media review platform for the creative industry. I've been using F-Track for the last six years, and it has helped me with all my visual effects projects. Forget about all the messy spreadsheets and the shared documents. F-Track is the best way to create a visual effects pipeline and to manage and communicate with your team and clients both locally and remotely. You can go to the video's description below for more information, or you can visit ftrack.com. This episode is also sponsored by Action VFX. Action VFX is the best place to get high quality stock footage. I've used Action VFX in game cinematics, short films, trailers, and commercials. They are the best stock footage I've ever come across. You can also use the promo code Yugosdesk for 10% off. Please visit actionvfx.com to learn more. And now on to the show. Hi everyone, welcome to the latest VFX Notes podcast. I'm Ian Fales from Befores and Afters, and as always, I'm joined by Hugo Guerra from Hugo's Desk. Hi Hugo, how are you? I'm very good, Ian. How is everyone do- How is everyone doing now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm good down under. You're still in London. Yep. Um, the world keeps going by, and <laughs> we are really loving doing the VFX Notes podcast. One thing I've really enjoyed, Hugo, is seeing some great support that we've been getting yes. from um, our supporters, our advertisers and sponsors, but also our patrons on yeah. Patreon. That's been a really cool thing, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Yeah. So so I really would like to thank everyone supporting the show and everyone giving us, sending us really nice messages. And as always, you know, if you guys want to support the show, if you like the show... You can support the show and get it three days before everyone else. Mm. And, and exclusive also exclusive and early. Exactly. Exclusive is an early. And if you join us on Patreon, either on Hugo's Desk on Patreon or before and afters on Patreon. And not only it's before everyone else, but also you get it ad free. There's no ads on the beginning. There's also mm. no ads on YouTube. You just basically have a seamless experience with no interruptions, you know, <laughs> which is good. Yeah. So thanks everyone for that. You can support us either at Hugo's Patreon or mine, which is the befores and afters one. Um, You get to pick. (laughs) You get to pick who you like most is what I said on Twitter the other day. And I think we all know who that is, right? We all know who that is. It's you, of course. Look at you. (laughs) Hugo, today we're talking about Christopher Nolan films. Christopher Nolan's film. Wow, this... (laughs) This film is already tongue tying me. <laughs> <laughs> Tenet. Yes. And look, what I was gonna do for everyone at home watching, listening, was basically get you for the next twenty five minutes, Hugo, oh, to explain <laughs> how the Tenet universe works. Okay, go. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have to say, like, I I had to watch this film three times. Uh, I'll be honest, like, mm. and I I think I got it. I think so. Oh, it's gone. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, I think I got it. No, I think the film. Uh, in unfortunately, we're gonna talk more about that. But in, I think, unfortunately, you need to watch it quite a few times. I think to fully, fully grasp it. And sure, I guess that's fine. There's many films we've watched in our lives that we have to watch several times, like 2001, those kind of films that you have to watch several times. But uh, I don't know if it's supposed to be like that. I mean, I kind of like when a film just you watch it and you understand it. So I, I don't know. Like, I feel like maybe there's like something a bit wrong, not wrong, but like if the film can't transmit everything in the first time, maybe either it's too thick or it's not being explained correctly. I don't know. Like, but it, it's, it's very complicated. This film is extremely complicated. Yeah. It is. Yeah. But there is a reason why it is. there's a reason why we're talking about the film though. Like, isn't it like, because the film won the Oscar for visual effects last year. And yep. I guess we are going to know very soon who's the nominees for the, the Oscars this year. So that's kind of why we kind of like thought of, of kind of like going back to this film. Uh, I guess, I guess, <laughs> no pun intended, going backwards. <laughs> <to this film. laughs> no, you, that's right. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's an amazing film in my view and the visual effects amazing as well. We'll get to it eventually, but there's not that many of them, which is an interesting thing. Um, and that's also sort of a characteristic thing about Chris Nolan films. Um, even when there are lots of visual effects, it's often there, there's there's that... more than than people realize. That's the thing. Yeah, I want to talk about that, but 
There's a lot more. There's about 300. It's 270 something shots on the film, which is, of course, very little. Yeah, I, I know you're mm. right. Like it's usually normal films like this are thousands of visual effects shots. So, so 300 doesn't seem much, but man, they are big. <laughs> That's for sure. Big shots and complicated. <laughs> yeah. Um, parts of complicated scenery. I wanted to pick up on the confusing aspect of the film for a second, Hugo. I, I agree. I saw this film, which must have been during the um, lockdown here in Australia, because I saw it in a cinema with about five people at a press screening, one of the biggest cinemas here in Austra- in Sydney, but we were all socially distanced and only five people turned out to watch it. I didn't mind. I felt very safe sitting there with my mask and whatnot. And we all went away going, I really loved it, but I'm not (laughs) quite sure what was happening. And it it got a release worldwide that day. And I went online and I guarantee you, I usually hate these articles. I hate them. People might know this if they follow me on social media, but they were the what does the ending of Tenet mean or Tenet explained? Yeah, yeah. And I reckon I read about five of them and they were fantastic because they really picked up on the layers and the how the backwards stuff worked and yeah. they also had a few theories about whether a certain character was a certain person, all that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm going to say, Hugo, I agree with you a little bit about if you can't get it on the first viewing, like what's the point of that? I enjoyed Tenant by researching it afterwards yeah, and then watching it about three other times and learning and hearing more things. Yeah. So the experience got better and better. Yeah. But do you, I do grows. agree. It grows on you. Yeah. And, and don't get me wrong. I didn't say that it ne- all films need to be watched the first time and you fully understood it. I don't, I don't agree with that. Like, I, I think... A lot of films are like that. A lot of films you have to watch several times. You know, m- multiple films from Kubrick were like that as well. And I love Kubrick. So I-, I think I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. And you're right. It's really a mystery because then you want to watch it again and watch it again. But I think I had a bad experience the first time I watched the film because I couldn't go to the cinema. You know, we were in lockdown. Couldn't go. And so I didn't go to see the film. You know, never went to see the film. And then progressively, there was a lot of uh, some negativity online about the film. And then, you know, the film didn't do as best, uh, as good as they thought it was going to be, of course, because there was a pandemic. And, yeah. and, and so I only ended up watching the film when it finally got released to the home uh, market. So I only watched right. the Blu-ray. I bought the 4K Blu-ray, lined up my projector and watched it for the first time when it came out. And I, you know, was a bit confused, didn't really understood it fully. It wasn't a cinema experience. I w- Although I watched it in 4K, it's not the same as watching an IMAX. And I think, I think, I think that was probably why, you know. And then I watched it again um, a few months ago, and I really loved it the second time, much, but much more than the first time. And now, last night, I watched it again, and it was even better. And this film is really growing on me, and I'm starting to like it more and more. And now I'll 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 be honest. I'll say one thing that maybe it's controversial. I kind of feel that this is his best film. I I feel like the more I watch oh, it, oh yeah, I think this is his oh. best film. <laughs> Hands down. Hands yeah. down. Yeah. This is his best film for so many reasons. Yeah. One of them is just the experience. Yeah. Now I know you're watching it at home, but on the big screen, the sound. And we yeah. might get to talk about the sound. I, I, I watched it on was... a big screen as well. I watched it on a projector, but obviously I know it's not right. an IMAX. I, I wish, because, you yeah. know, I, I went to see Dunkirk on a real IMAX screening, mm. not, not the digital one, a real one. And it was mind blowing. So I imagine yep. the tenant would be the same watching it with that resolution, you know. I didn't see it on IMAX either, but there is a really big screen in Sydney that is wide. Um, and uh, it's a, such a shame not to see it in IMAX. But but the the way this film hits you and then the way it makes you think and the way you don't want it to end, that's yes. a movie-going experience for me. Yeah, and I really the want to only, know more about the, them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The only drawback was that almost deliberately, I think Chris Nolan had the sound mix at a deliberately confusing level. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes they're wearing masks. Sometimes the opening, say, attack on the theater, you you cannot hear what they're saying. And I think it's deliberate because yeah. when I watched it with my partner at home, we had the 
you know, the subtitles, the subtitles on and actually new story plots yeah. <laughs> and plot points come out at you. So that's what I mean by you get a different yeah. experience each time. But I kind of got what he was doing with the sound mix. I just didn't appreciate it. Well, he, he did the, the same time. with Dunkirk as well. Dunkirk is also a bit too loud as well. It had the same issue. You know, me, me and Anna, we are Portuguese, so we obviously we are we are capable of hearing and understanding English, but we still put subtitles, not Portuguese ones, English one. We put subtitles on everything uh, because it's just easier for us to kind of like read to make sure, especially with the accents, we are we sometimes it's a bit tough. So I highly recommend watching the film with subtitles. Yes, I do because the the film will it will help you. I know it's a bit bad because it gets in front of the screen and everything, but. But it's really worth watching at least once with all the subtitles on so that you can really read everything. And Because the film is very, very thick in lore. And I guess going back to the question you asked me, <laughs> if I wanted to explain the film, I guess I think, you know, people... <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> no, but people really need to, like, go and see it. But I think for me, like, personally, if I have to explain it in a very short time, this is a heist film. That's the f most thing. It's a heist film, like a traditional completely traditional heist movie from the 60s and 70s the only difference is that the heists and and it's a time heist as they say it's a spy thriller mixed with with back to the future almost because it's like a a time it's it's they say it on the film and there's a there's a sentence that really resonates with me which is the future is attacking the past and i think that's one of the most uh, the best explanation the film has you know where Someone in the future wants to change something because things didn't work out as they should, as they are not working out, uh, even as we now <laughs> move on in the world, things are not working out uh, as they should with climate change and with all those problems. And someone from the future is attacking the past so that, we, so that things can be changed. And I, I think that concept is brilliant. The idea that you can have objects that can be traveling backwards and people traveling backwards. And this is fascinating because most films have the, like the Back to the Future, you know, they have a device and then they go back. That's it. <laughs> but mm. this is so fascinating because they're going backwards in real time. So they're like going, it's almost like you spend a year forward in COVID, for example, and now they're going to spend a year backwards. It's, it's, it's a fascinating concept. And although the film is not completely uh, accurate and it's not supposed to be completely accurate in terms of physics and in terms of theory, it is... At least, you know, they, they, Kit Thorne w was like a bit involved and he did some consulting and he had a lot of consultants. So the film tries to be scientific, but it's more of a, of like a, 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 a plot device almost, you know, which is really interesting. But I, I, I think people really need to give it another chance because if you really think about this film, it's one of the most interesting spy films I've seen in a long time because it's such yeah. a modern twist. It's like a... It's like James Bond, but it's in in timelines. It's it's just really yeah. really bonkers, isn't the, it? The, that's right. The the inversion plot device that isn't time travel at all is brilliant, but it does continue that Chris Nolan thing that I find where, I mean, obviously Dunkirk was a real story based on a real story, but it feels to me like what Christopher Nolan is doing is making these highly fantastical sci-fi films that feel like maybe like maybe just maybe it could <laughs> happen like maybe inception is something that could happen maybe inversion is something that could happen and i i don't th those films are pretty rare because you get too futury with yeah. some other high concept time travel stuff and this this just stayed so grounded i mean that's it's clearly what he's going for um, and because you can relate very closely to the characters, um, I think that's part of it too. It, and just on the inversion stuff, Hugo, even you just saying that stuff then got my mind ticking over and like, oh, do I need to think about it? That one character is now like forever just going, going backwards, inverted yeah. <laughs> yeah. until they can flip over if they want to. Yeah. Like it's really... It starts messing with your brain. 
There's even a line in the film which says, don't think about it too hard or something like that, isn't it? I had it on my notes here, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't, so don't think too much awesome. about it. <laughs> no, it is. I it is an awesome film. And, and also not not just the plot and, and the spectacular of all of it, which we will go into. I have a lot of notes to talk about the DOP and the IMAX and everything. There's also another thing that this film has that is rare, and Nolan does this really well. The film has seven locations worldwide. You know, It's filmed on seven different places. You know, Denmark, Estonia, India, Italy, Norway, United Kingdom, United States, and typical pre-pandemic film, you know, where they traveled all around. There was like 200 people on the shoot, 90 days of shooting, 90 days. It's a long, long shoot. Um, and this film is as, as big as it can get, isn't it? It is like big, huge, multiple places, locations that only show up for like a few minutes. It's like a, a completely, it's like a traveling circus. <laughs> they go everywhere on this film. Yeah, it's insane. But, but also, like, not the classic Hollywood no. locations. No, no. Like that Estonian theater, which I'm going to just say I've stood on and walked over. Because you, you, if you go to Tallinn in Estonia from, say, um, over the Mediterranean. No, it's not the Mediterranean, is it? Anyway, it doesn't no, no, matter. Okay. <laughs> um, you. You walk past that theater, yeah. which is like abandoned as you go to Talon. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's some classic locations in this film that don't feel like any other film. Yeah. Tal That's Talon, how I feel Talon about is it a too. beautiful place. I've been there shooting already. It's a really popular place to film. I was there in 2015 uh, supervising a short film. And it's a, yeah, it's a beautiful town. It's funny because I recognize so many of the streets on the film and recognize some corners in some places because I was yeah. there for a whole week shooting. Um, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. It's not a, they no, never have the glamorous places like double, it's like 007, but for real, you know, like he's, he's in actual, yeah. in actual places where maybe spionage would be happening for real <laughs> and, and actually things would be happening for real, you know. And let's talk about like I guess it's a, it's it's a good idea to start with that. As always, Christopher Nolan has the best intros in movies. And hmm. again, you know, because if you look at the way that uh, uh, the Joker comes in on Batman on the second film, and even how Bane shows up on the third Batman, mm -hmm. and even you know now this intro as well, the way he jumps people into the film, it's always high stakes, high tempo loud music, and you really, okay, you're in. I'm plugged in now. And this intro is very powerful. C practically all shot on IMAX, because the film does jump from IMAX to, to 65. Um, so there's like, you can kind of see the bars sometimes show up and then they, they sometimes go away. Uh, the film does jump from, from, from really large format to large format, <laughs> because the film is all shot in large format, but it's just like from IMAX to 65 millimeter. Um, and that opening shot, the way it's filmed, the, the one point perspective, the way the camera is moving with these SWAT team coming into the building, the way that the, the panicky and the, and the, and the, the yeah, inside the theater happens, the way the first pump of music shows up when they shoot the first time, it's spectacular, isn't it? That beginning. It's just absolutely spectacular. Oh yeah. I love it. And then occasionally a few things happen that don't make sense like that bullet yeah. going in inverted time and you're like what did i just see there yeah shout, um, shout out to dnag that was a really 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 nice and subtle composite that was there um it's mm. a very very pretty uh compositing moment um but yeah no that i know i know exactly what you mean that happens all the time on those films with him but that's why he grabs you because then you are you're set you go in and even the first time i watched the film i was blown away by that intro didn't really fully understood it, um, you know, and then the guy taking out the teeth and everything, like, didn't understand anything that was happening. Um, but, but yeah, no, it's, 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 you guys need to go in and see it again. But I guess, I guess let's, let's, we both like the film. There's no uh, thing there. Obviously, it's been growing with me. I didn't like it the first time. And I think I, I know a lot of people that had the same thing. I remember when the film came out, on Twitter and some of my friends and also people on my wall on social media. A lot of people hated the film. A bit like me, I didn't like the film the first time I watched it. I think everyone needs to go and see it again and give it another chance. Um, because, because I'm not saying you're going to like the film. I'm not forcing anyone to watch the film. But I'm just saying it is different to watch it again. It's a completely different experience watching it a second time. 
completely different because you're watching to other things. You're more more you're more into the story. You already seen some parts, so you're now like trying to find other clues on the story, and it's just a fantastic experience to watch it the second time. You know, absolutely. Uh, I also often go into these films having seen the trailer and knowing a little bit about the visual effects. In particular, Hugo, this is one of those films where so much was made of the practical effects yes. before it got released, and including the plane crash. Oh, yeah. I, I, it's it's clearly a big visual effects and special effects sequence. It may as well be one that we talk about. But that was kind of intriguing, how much they made of the fact that they bought a real plane and crashed it. And then as the film got released and as I did some visual effects stories and more and more got talked about, it was amazing that that actually was what they did. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you hear them talk about it and, oh, okay, well, but they might replace it with a fully CG plane or, you know, do a lot more CG work than we realize. There's clearly heaps of compositing done and we can talk about that in a minute. Yeah. But I, I kind of did love the visceral side of that plane, right? It was yeah. it was high impact. It was, yeah. It's funny that you're saying that because you know, as as you know, you know, we're we're both uh, we're both judges on the Visual Effects Society and sometimes we do see breakdowns of things that don't come public. And I've seen that in in you know, over the years I've been a judge for 10 years and I've seen films where they've categorically said it wasn't any VFX, and they keep mm. saying mm. there was no VFX. And then mm. you see the breakdowns privately on the Visual Effects Society judge panel, and then you see that actually there were visual effects, but they're somehow being hidden uh, by the production. And that happens a lot of times. It happens a lot, but not on this film, no. You watch the breakdowns, yeah, there's a, unless they're really, really going deep and doing visual effects for the breakdowns, <laughs> which I doubt, <laughs> and that would have been funny, but, but I, I, and you know, it turns out, imagine like seven years from now, like, like, yeah, we actually did a CG plane for the breakdown. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But no, this is a real plane and it has all to do with Nolan's approach, you know, and if you look at how Nolan has done all his films and... Also his crew, because he always uses the same people, although he had a new DOP uh, since then, Kirk, because obviously uh, his previous DOP became a director now, so he couldn't really continue doing the film. But um, the way they approach is always, okay, how do we film it? Let's try to film it for real. That's the first option. Second option is always, okay, uh, I'm, I'm afraid we can't do it for real. Okay, if we can't do it for real, can we do it with plates, compositing, cleanup, painting? Okay, let's do that way. Oh, it didn't work. We couldn't do it that way. Okay, fine. Third and last choice, full CG. That's always his approach. The CG, no disrespect to CG, but the CG is always the last resort. That's always yeah, his I, philosophy. Hugo, and I, you see his interviews and that's how he deals with things, you know, so yeah. I, I think I, I think that is in, in some ways his approach. Yeah. I, I interviewed the visual effects supervisor here, Andrew Jackson, who had, of course, worked on Dunkirk. And the plane thing, I mean, yes, there was a lot of marketing value from yeah. getting a plane and crashing it. But I think I think one of the things out of that interview was, well, this is the shot that we need. It's not a huge explosion crash thing. It's meant to be a distraction right into the hangar. Yes, the, the um, funny that's the, the funniest uh, part of the film for me when he says, uh, crashing the plane, oh, don't be dramatic. <laughs> That's right. It's such a funny line, like crashing it from the from the air. Oh, don't be dramatic. <laughs> it's yeah. so so cool. That that uh, it's such a nice yeah. scene. <laughs> but but the point I was going to make as well was in this case they did explore miniatures. They and did. CG. Yeah, I know, no, I know, I know. And and they came to the view that it was highly likely that was going to cost. Yes just as much as doing this because these planes are available to buy you hear about some productions doing it yeah and also it was a scrapyard they got it on a scrapyard so the yeah, plane you know was yeah. covered with pigeon shit as they say they had to clean it all and put the internals mm. of it and it even had brakes <laughs> they had to put new brakes on it so yeah they had to kind of rebuild the plane because the plane was in really bad shape but i yeah. I, I fully understand that it could pro probably be more expensive because if you think about it 
a shot like that to be photo real on IMAX at six and a half K, which is the resolution they were mm. working on. I mean, that's not going to be cheap. You know, we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of hundreds of thousands of pounds just to do that shot and a couple of shots. If you if you do the entire sequence, that could be millions in visual effects. And yeah, I, I and feel miniatures, like miniatures, yeah. yes, but not flexible. If it didn't work, you yeah. then have to go down the CG route. Yeah. So really, ultimately, it's clearly the best approach. And um, a shout out there as well, of course, to special effects supervisor Scott Fisher, oh, yeah, yeah. who I imagine orchestrated some of that, including the, some of the explosions that happen in the um, when it hits that hangar. Yeah. But obviously, it is a Chris Nolan type thing. Yes. <laughs> we can say that, and he must have been pretty stoked to be able to do this and ram a plane into. Hangar, but it, but right? it, I, like, I have to say, I have to say one thing though like that shot th that sequence is amazing and it's mind blowing but I, researching to this film I kind of felt that that I know this respect but I feel like sometimes when they're talking they kind of they kind of undermine a little bit the amount of work that was still done because there's so much visual effect on those shots as well but it's never really fully mentioned. It's almost like, sure. yeah, we shot it for real. But when you look at the breakdown, which is public, you know, and, and it's actually rolling now as we speak. You're going to see it on the screen on the YouTube version of this podcast. I always put as many breakdowns as possible when I find them, of course. Uh, and if you look at the, the thing, there's like CG trees all over the place. There's like trees. wire removals. There's a CG yeah. ambulance. There's like CG yeah. replicas on the back, CG cars extensions of of the little little there's an enormous amount of cleanup happening everywhere on all the shots and it's so and this is all of course let's not forget on imax six and a half k resolution it's not an easy feat so these shots are incredibly complex shots to do tracking and to do cleanup and compositing Obviously, there's more compositing than CG, which is usually the opposite. Usually, we have more CG. This time, we have more compositing. And also, not to mention the amount of roto and paint, because sometimes, you know, as much as the stunt uh, actors were amazing doing the reversal, sometimes it didn't work out. So sometimes they do replace complete people on the background. And you see that on the breakdown, you see just someone gone or someone being replaced by someone else or someone being moved around to another place on the plate. I know it looks trivial, but those things are not trivial. They're so hard to do. No, and and I, they never really mention it. And I, I think it's because it's like, oh, we didn't do a CG train, a plane, so then, then it's no CG on it. But there is. There is a lot of visual effects yeah. on those shots, you know. I th you're, of course, right. And um, I suppose the way to think about that, at least from their point of view, isn't that that's the central stuff. I know. The central thing is the plane. Of course. And the other stuff is the invisible are the invisible effects that are necessary to make the shot as dynamic as possible because they're adding jet blast and, yeah. and whatnot. I mean, Hugo, VFX suits say this all the time. If you've got some, and you're one of them, yeah. got something in the plate oh, yeah. that is real, everything else you do to the plate is going to be based on what you've shot. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the argument and, is yeah. that Dean Egg could have done an incredible CG plane yeah. crash. Yeah, no, of course, of course they could. But it might have never have been kind of as good as the real thing. But that's that's the approach. I mean, I as a visual effects supervisor, this is my approach as well. Whenever I do something, I try to shoot it in the can for real because it just guides the entire production to the to the result and also to the objective of what we're trying to make. So even if they did, even if they did this in CG, most likely they would have had a, a plane there just at least to photograph it with the real lighting, you know, at least. So I think, but also there's other reasons for them to have the plane. There's a lot of shots in the plane and around the plane that are, don't have to do with the explosion, but they have to do with the when they take over the plane, when they rob the plane, and when they have the gold being dropped. They had so many shots happening in the plane. They can't really fix that with CG. As much as people think that that virtual production can solve everything, you can't really shoot that on virtual production. You can't just have a CG background and have those kind of plates, you know. So, but no, but that that's really my favorite approach as a as a visual effects supervisor, and that's the approach they always do here. If they can shoot it, then they have the perfect reference, you know. But no, but it, it's 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 a beautiful shot. It's not the I know it's the one that everyone kind of talks about, but there is some. 
the brilliance of the visual effects on this film, and if you don't mind, I would like to kind of move on to another place, which is not really visual effects heavy. Well, it is, but it isn't. Like, but it's also the way that they use visual effects to help the production, not in not actually doing the visual effects. And this is the the car chase in Talon, sure. together with the trucks as well. And on this situation in here, obviously there's heaps of visual effects. You know, there's like cleanups of the wires of pushing the cars and to reverse the the, the tires. And sometimes the tires are or moving forwards and then they pull the car with a with the with the wire so that the car goes backwards so then you get the spin reverse again trying to achieve everything on camera and then just roto and painting and patching to try to kind of rebuild the plate from two plates or three there's also several shots on that highway of the car chase where you have full CG environments on the background. I don't think a lot of people know that, but a lot of times they've replaced the whole sky and sometimes they replace all the buildings on the background and the entire uh, background um, uh, after the, the, the multiple bridges that that highway has. So there's a lot of really heavy CG there, but what I love is the way they used CG to help the production. So basically use previs to figure out everything on this film. And I love that. I love that they've used visual effects in such a creative way to actually pre-visualize the two opposing timelines, you know, so that this happens on the car chase, but also happens on the fight in the airport inside the, inside the, um, the, um, the warehouse. The, the, I can't remember the name of the warehouse, but the Pentagon warehouse. They basically use to their advantage CG simulation to simulate how would we have these two actions happening backwards and forwards, simulating it with previs. And that's brilliant. That's a brilliant use of visual effects, not for a resulting frame, but to help a production, isn't it? It's, it's amazing the way they used it. Well, let's just say that most people on the film, having read the script, would be like, <laughs> what the... F is going on and so <laughs> it makes a lot of sense i'm sure that they use matchbox cars and yeah, they cutouts There's as well most, to, most to multiple photos come, come and, and by the way on this book this big this book is covered with those kind of photos <laughs> really really yeah. recommend people to check out this book it's a really nice book of how this film was made you guys should check it out <laughs> yeah yeah i mean why not use pr the tools that are around to Show, to give a more animated look and feel to something where cars are moving around and, and it is animated. Um, but it's brilliant that's... the way that they actually had, you know, the way if you look at uh, how Jackson talks about how they've kind of like took care of this, they actually had a previous artist on the shoot, on the set the whole time, making adaptations to the previous, changing it and actually showing the previous to everyone. And I think that's brilliant. And I, a lot of times... A lot of times I wish more productions would have pre-visualization on, on the set, you know, and I, I feel like we now live in a time where we could do that really easily because we now have Unreal and, and it's so easy to just have a, a beefed up laptop on the set and just have Unreal to set up everything. I'm not saying they used Unreal here, they didn't, but what I mean is like you could do that more in productions and it would save a lot of... A lot of problems that show up in, in visual effects productions by solving them before. So really props for, for Andrew Jackson by doing that, by having that decision of having a pre-visualization artist on the set, because it really helped. It, it, it really helped, and I'm sure everyone kind of fully understood it. When, when you see something, then you understand it. It's like the visual side of it is so much better, you know? Yeah. I think also there, there's a thing that I remember taking away from watching it and talking to Dean Egg about the film was when they did have to do a reversing inverted CG explosion or dust simulation inverted or not re inverted, right? F forward or backwards. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like it was, this might sound really obvious, but it was highly beneficial that these tools that we now use, Houdini and otherwise, use maths and science to do the simulation because I'm sure that essentially they're plugging in the inverted qualities of those kind of explosions, but then still aren't directing them, right? That's because yeah. that's always what happens. But there was something kind of, and it's because this film is that fantastical reality 
which is it needs to look real. So the explosions are pretty big, but they're not kind of like Marvel big. No, no. Right? So so even when it's a digital explosion or a digital dusting or, or a CG car, it's still subtle. Yeah. And yeah, that, absolutely. that is really why the visual effects work so well. I think it's why the film won the Oscar. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. For visual effects. And I think... I think there was just some sequences in the film that suited it. Yeah. Like the freeway chase just suited subtle visual effects, not over the top stuff. Yeah. But that's that's why I think that's why it won the Oscar. Because the the thing with this is that the film, you know, the film the way it um they build it, it's so subtle. And you look at these explosions, you look at the car flipping, and everyone always assumes the CG is somewhere else. You know, like, oh, the car flipping, that's a CG car. But no, the car is actually for real, but then the CG is actually the background in the sky. Or on the explosion, they feel, oh, that explosion is CG. But then the explosion is not CG, the explosion is real, but then the reversed explosion is CG. And so the full merging of pixel perfect, pixel perfect merging of real explosion with CG explosion, real cars with CG cars, Real streets with CG streets. It's flawless. It, 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 this happens all everywhere. It happens on the sailboat. It happens on the cars. It happens on the last fight on the war zone. E- even the buildings exploding. Some of them are extended on CG, but some of them are real and some of them are miniatures. You can't tell the difference. Everyone watching this film, when they were voting for the Oscar, I'm sure a lot of people assume certain things that didn't actually happen, but then other things that happened they didn't even know about. And I I'm think gonna give that, you, yeah. I'm going to give you an example of that. Yeah. From my own point of view, which is I was kind of convinced that the hydrofoil yacht race, when I first watched the film, was completely CG boats. <laughs> because I just I just thought it's a hard thing to film, a hard thing to stage. Um, maybe I had COVID in my head, but of course <laughs> this was made before COVID. It was just released during... And what's really nice when you watch the breakdowns of the yacht race is that it's a bit of a mix of everything. Absolutely, they're replacing the sails. Because, Sometimes, you know, not always. Sometimes. You know, that's right. That's what I mean by mix. They're doing face replacements because they're stunts, right? They're not going to put their real actors yeah. in these On some shots, crazy, again. Yeah. Some are, some others are not. And, yeah. and it, that's why this is amazing. That's why this yeah. constructing this film, it's mind-blowing. Sometimes you have... On some shots, they're using the sea. And on the next shot, they're using a full CG simulation. And then on the next shot, they're not again. And it's just, like, amazing. I, I can't... I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. You know, I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. Like, it's it's the way... Yeah. Dean Egg has perfected this, let's be honest. Like, Dean Egg is now the masters at this. Like, I, they, well, they are... They are... They are. Yeah. Of doing they, invisible. I, like, they, they become... I think that's their IP now. <laughs> You know, like it's it's like I the think invisibility. So. It's it's probably here a Chris Nolan thing, and because Dean Egg has worked with him on, on so all many of the films now, yeah, on almost all know. of the films, yeah, yeah. But you could also argue it's a bit of an Andrew Jackson film. Mad Max, sorry, Andrew, I meant Andrew Jackson, the VFX approach. Yeah, yeah. Mad Max has so many different types of ways it does its crazy effects, including Absolutely. stunts and practical stuff, and then Dunkirk as we're saying is like uh, like is it a real plane is it a is it some cockpit shot i mean we talk about this probably in previous podcasts hugo but when the techniques are mixed up no one can quickly say oh that's cg or that's practical or that's whatever and really what we're really saying is if the editing is working and you're immersed in the story you're not even going to notice so the only reason I thought those yachts were CG is that those were flying so freaking fast. <laughs> but they do, they do that. And then I and that. then I went and read about these super yachts which go bananas. Fifty knots, speeds. yeah. They go fifty knots. It's insane. Yeah. It's insane. And so that's why I thought a lot of it wasn't real. And there's there's like um, actually there's actually uh, to a point that <laughs> it's so funny to a point that they couldn't shoot them for real. They thought, okay, let's just shoot them for real and have a boat next to them filming them. It wasn't possible because the boat couldn't catch up with the boat. Yeah. <laughs> so the other boat couldn't. It. So the, it was shaking so much, it. the camera was like blah, 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 going up and down. So they, they actually, on some shots, actually attached 
part of that boat to another boat and so that you are filming and you think almost like they when they do with the car rigs you think they're filming the actual boat on the sea but they're not the boat is actually attached to another boat and then that boat is going fast but it's not as fast as it should be of course so there is like um, the the whole approach of the film man there's so much old school techniques on this film you know you even you like you have like rigs attached to rigs on both the boats like on that sequence and on the cars you have like full actual physical matte paintings on the back even on the car chase i know we shouldn't going back to the car chase for a second even on the car chase on some shots they're using rear projection playback on the car chase so there's there's even like they're inside the car and what you're seeing on the back of the of the windows is actually painting sometimes it's even just a painting on certain shots and of course it's shot with the real light on the location not in the studio not on a green screen so that they can actually have it all look the same this is amazing they have also forced perspective on this shot show, show as well the, the the caves in the end all those caves that they look infinite they are actually forced perspective painting and it's just amazing how now, they do this you know yeah now you mentioned old school We're, i'm going to talk about miniatures in a minute or bigatures but the old school thing we haven't mentioned is reverse school <laughs> which is the the actors and stunt performers Acting. learning to fight <laughs> to run to walk backwards you got to watch the dvd for this it's film it's amazing isn't it it's like they're I, like whoop, whoop. i flip out i flip out when i watch that but they um, do it so well the don't they, they, they the stunt man congratulations to the entire to all the team of this film but the stunt people on this team my god and stunt coordinator was george uh, george kotel and my god him and his team Damn, they, they nailed it, didn't they? If you watch the behind the scenes, you see people doing a flip and then doing a backwards flip. And it what happened? Did they move the camera backwards? No, they didn't. The person actually no. did it. it it's, I, it's insane. It's stunning to watch people and they've learned it and practiced it <laughs> from watching footage, sure. But it had to work on camera and not look silly, reverse exactly. Benny Hill, whatever stuff. I, I actually, it's one of my favorite things about the film... That again, when you're immersed in it, you almost forget that they're not really running backwards. They're inverted. Yeah. It's something to always actually remember as you're yeah. re-watching that, this film. One of the best sequences on the fight on the airport where the guy is dragging in the floor backwards. It's yeah. amazing, that yeah, shot. Yeah, I love it. I love it's it. It's just a beautiful shot, which also was done by practicing. I think it also ha goes back to the way that they did the animatics as well, because the, the doing the previous really helped to, for them to sort yes. out that, yep. and also the way. Shout out to the DOP, you know, which I'm sure I'm going to butcher his name, uh, Yut Van Hutem, I guess something like that. I'm I'm so sorry if I butchered your name, but um, shout out to his to the DOP work as well here because they also had an amazing complex system of actually filming forwards and backwards and also loathing. They had to adapt the IMAX camera so they can actually have the camera film backwards because the mm. IMAX camera mm. does not film backwards. Normally film cameras don't film backwards. Yeah. And so they had to do a new motor for that. And also sometimes they would be shooting moving forward but the magazine would be shooting backwards. Sometimes the magazine would be shooting forward, normal, but yeah. then they would be walking backwards. Just to figure this out, when to shoot backwards, when to put the magazine backwards, when to put the magazine forward. And yeah. this is why this is such an amazing collaboration. You know, The editor, Jennifer Lame, which she did an amazing job. I, I think she's amazing on this film. She was on set the whole time. They were constantly re-editing and editing and testing and checking the dailies. They watch dailies every day as well. And this is really necessary because if you just do one little mistake on something, it fails, the whole thing fails. So you have yep. to like, and especially on that airport sequence, they have to do it twice. They have to do it on the beginning and then they, they go back to the airport on a different perspective. Just the, just the logistics of doing this the stunts going backwards sometimes the stunts going forward sometimes and then the camera and the i i f i feel again technology to the aid using simulation in computers to actually figure this out is a brilliant choice because yeah. it's impossible to do it any other way and 
And Hugo, I don't want to get into this, but does your mind ever go go to mush when you think about the fact that that event's already happened, but he <laughs> runs in from the plane crash <laughs> into and has a fight with himself, but he's already done it. Like, do you, let's, I mean, sorry, everybody. Sorry, everybody, but I, it I just know. melts I my know. brain. It does. Anyway. It, it does melt my brain. Absolutely. And also, like, he's trying to shoot himself, but he, like, oh, yeah, never mind. <laughs> yeah, don't start. Okay, we mentioned some old school stuff. I love the miniature buildings in particular in that third act um, heist. I mean, it's the big heist, really. Yeah. Um, the, the temporal one of the coolest pin, pincher, temporal pincher movement. Pincer, pincer, pincer movement. Pincer yeah. movement, yeah. <laughs> in that end battle. It's cowboy, think, sh- cowboy shit. <laughs> yeah. So for these buildings where one, the top explodes and one, the bottom explodes because we're going at, we've got two things happening. One team's inverted. They built two one third scale miniatures, which I guess people are calling bigotures. <laughs> they filmed them in natural light. They filmed them They're out not really where they were filming this <laughs> thing. <laughs> They're not miniatures yeah. anymore. <laughs> and then... You know, this is the this is the gold standard DNEG compositing stuff. Oh yeah, where they're also matching simulations for the explosions, um, and matching practical explosions. I just can't get enough of watching the breakdowns of those miniatures, and actually trying to find some seams and trying to see where it works and doesn't work. The debris that comes from the explosions is the thing that I love looking at and slowing down in my, in my rewatch as well. But Hugo, that's a great sequence, isn't it? It is. It's, it's mind blowing. The, um, the, the sheer amount of visual effects and practical that happens on these shots, you know, let's not forget that even not talk, even before we talk about the visual effects, this was shot with 600 extras. That's the first thing. Mind-blowing achievement to organize 600 people. Some of them going backwards, some of them going forwards. It's, so mm. I don't even imagine how much time and work the first AD, the second AD, and the third AD had to, to kind of like organize this crap because it's my God, 600 people moving correctly. Then you have four real Chinook helicopters for real. They are there. They are actual helicopters. But then, of course, you do have CG helicopters. But also on some shots, you have 2D helicopters that they've just removed from another plate and put on another plate. The sheer amount, let me just do a little small breakdown. You, you have CG helicopters mixed with real helicopters and mixed with two helicopters. And then you have snow on the mountains, which is all CG because there's no snow at that time. Then also the mountains are completely retouched because sometimes there were parts they didn't want to show. Sometimes they were parts they want to clean up. Craters that aren't there, other craters that are there, they've mixed around and painted and moved it around. It's like buildings moved around and crews removed. All sorts of cleanup happening there. Then, of course, you have the bigotures that you say that you're talking about, which are completely seamlessly merged into the real uh, buildings that are there. And then to add to all of that, you also have on a lot on, on dozens of shots where you have hundreds of people walking on the back, you do see it on the breakdown that they are actually some people are moved around, some people are removed, some people are added. And then the CG shock wave as well. That's a CG shock wave. That entire section is just mind blowing. Not not just from the visual effects, but also the way it was shot, the visceral of it, like like a war zone shot, handheld most of it, like running with the troops. It's just really beautiful cinematography going on there. You know, it's just and it's it's. It's like a town in California. Like it's a <laughs> it's an abandoned ghost town called Eagle Mountain. Um, I assume it was a some sort of iron mine or something like that. Yeah, um, it's a mine. So, yeah, it's an old mine. I can't remember what yeah. it is, but yeah, it's an old mine, abandoned. Even I mean, the interiors. I'm guessing. I'm guessing it's been in other films, but I didn't recognize it. <laughs> and um, uh, what a perfect location for what goes on in that sequence, which is also. We will not discuss what it all means, Hugo, because I will not get to sleep tonight as I think about what was really going on. The funny um, thing about that sequence is that you won when the film ends and they they get it, you know, they they may manage to 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 succeed on the end of the sequence. They you really want to see more, don't you? Like, like I really want to see other heists they've done. When when Neil says to him, "We we're gonna do some stuff." 
Like he just says, we're going to do some stuff. You, you'll you see. You're just halfway through it. We're going to meet again. And I'm kind of like, oh, man, I want to see that. I want to see the rest of the heist. I want to see the prequel. I want to see the sequel. Is there going to be a, another one? Of course, they won't be. I'm sure he's not going to do another one. But but it's amazing to think, isn't it? it? And that's why it resonates so much. These characters are really interesting for you to kind of imagine. They're out there somewhere inverting something. <laughs> yeah. 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 One thing. One thing yeah. I forgot about the old school stuff. I mentioned the 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 backwards projection, and we, we you, you talked about the miniatures. There's also an enormous amount of just really simple old school wire work. I'm not talking about wires right. when you're um, uh, putting people on the air, like when they go in Mumbai to the building. That's of course wire work. But the bungee, I, well, how does he say the the not the bungee, the inverse bungee jumping. Uh, yeah. But I'm talking about just like normal wires to make objects fall and go back to their hands, like the bullets and the, um, the little objects that they are inside the laboratory. That's really old school stuff with just like transparent wires that then they removed. It's really, really clever the way it's done as all, well, you know. Yeah. And it fits in with a very practical aesthetic, realistic... Um, Maybe this could happen. Maybe, maybe it's happened. <laughs> you know, that's how I sometimes feel about it. Um, you know, one of my favorite sequences, by the way, is that moment where the um, um, protagonist, because he never, he doesn't have a name, right? No, no, it's um, at the end of the credits, it says protagonist, yeah. Yeah. He goes and gets a lesson in what's going on by um clemence posey i don't know if i pronounced her name right yeah, yeah. and she's only in it briefly and i just i think i think that was a trailer moment or something that i just fell in love with and in the film it's just like it's just op it just makes you ask more questions than it answers <laughs> and i think i've watched that film as a clip many times just on youtube when i've seen it pop up but what i particularly love there is a bit of the way the bullets are handled and go in reverse. Yeah. Um, and it and it just, what I'm really getting at in terms of the visual effects is it never feels like anyone played with any of that, right? Yeah. That somehow they made this happen on set for real, and a lot of it is, of course. But I think that sort of, for me, sums up the whole feeling of the film, yeah. that actual one sequence. Yeah. It does, it does. And, and especially because not only there's like really old school wires there, but also like we've mentioned, someone came in and painted the entire corridor, you know, the, the, the room where they are with the with the with the drawers, that was hand painted by someone. I can't remember his name. I'm so sorry. I apologize. I can't remember his name. But I didn't make a note. But but he went in and painted that entire thing with forced perspective. And it's so clever because when you know what you're gonna shoot why not use force protect but why not paint stuff on the background if it's going to work it's going to work and i think the the whole approach of this film the way the dop is filming and, and let's not forget this is imax okay so there's nothing to hide it's difficult to hide stuff on imax you see everything you know like it's gives you a huge sense of scale because the the magazine the the, the it's not a sensor because it's real film but if you if you kind of correlate it to a sensor of a digital camera the sensor is so big that the depth of field becomes so much stronger than other films. Not extreme depth of field, not you know completely blown out that you just see bouquets, but it's just a subtle constructed depth of field that goes to the back. So it's like really close to camera, and it just starts to really fade into the focusing on the back, and then it goes progressively more and more and more. And that sense of scale, which we saw already on Dunkirk, we saw in all of his films, he always tries to shoot majority of the film on IMAX. But this film really takes it to the next level because the entire film is filmed like that. The entire film is practically filmed with 16 millimeters or higher. They use the two, two Panavisions with 16 mil and IMAX. And a little small thing, I don't know if people realize, they filmed so much, so much for this film because you have the reversal, you have the backwards, you have the slow motions, you have all those things. It's so, so, so much that it ended up being a million and a half feet of film. It's insane. It's absolutely insanity. Obviously, they didn't digitize everything, but because sometimes they were shooting in slow motion, of course, that really ramps up the film. And the magazines can only take three minutes. 
So that was a, 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 a problem as well. When they were on the boats, they had to like switch the magazine. And also the magazine is really complex to, to switch. So they can't just like have another magazine. They have to actually go to the harbor, change the magazine, then load up the boat again, and then go to the boat again. Same with the helicopter. They did that on Dunkirk as well. But this is just insanity. Like the, the, again, the complexity of trying to shoot this. And I'm I'm not saying that this makes any difference for the film being better or not. Like the film should live by itself. But if you start to investigate how this film was made, this film is some of the most complex shoots I've ever witnessed on a behind the scenes. I I, I like the sheer amount, the scale, and. Uh, I, I, I guess everything is big with Nolan. Yeah. <laughs> everything is well, always big. I was going to say, Hugo, do we think the film... Now, look, it won the Best Visual Effects Oscar. And a shout out to um, um, the team there. That was Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson, David Lee, Andrew Lockley, and Scott Fisher. But are we saying, Hugo, that the film got robbed at the Oscars... I think by so. only also having a nomination for production design. Yes, I absolutely, feel like absolutely. Yeah, with production design is which is amazing as well. You know, like like so Nathan Crowley, which also was the production designer, which he's he's amazing. He's been a long term, long time time uh, uh, um, filmmaker with Christopher Nolan, so they've collaborated on almost every film. No, I think it was robbed. I definitely think it it should have been. <laughs> a, I'm not saying win, but at least nominated for the OP. I mean, how is mm. this not nominated for cinematography? Because the the way it was shot and the way this film was filmed on handheld on on crates on like I, I just I think it should have been nominated for for DOP for editing as well. I should have been nominated for for visual effects, which was one. I also think it should have been nominated for best director and best film. And I'm not sure if it should have won because it was a very very tough year. It was a very very competitive year, but at least they should have nominated because. Directing this is an achievement, and I, I just the way just thinking about it hurts your mind. Now imagine trying to make it, you know, like it's just like the way that you have to organize all these shoots backwards and forwards. It's a mind. Sorry, per, per, pardon my French. It's a mind fuck. You know, it's just like how do you even start? You know, like it's really difficult <laughs> just yeah, to do this. I agree. Agree. Yeah, it was robbed. Yes, oh. let's say that it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, another shout out I wanted to quickly make was to the actress who played Cat, and that's Elizabeth Debicki, an Australian actress, who I think is really fantastic. She was in The Great Gatsby. Um, she's she's in a bunch of upcoming. She's in Wind things. Widows as well. It's an amazing film as well. Yeah, in Widows. Yeah. yeah, she was in this show called The Night Manager. Oh, yeah. um, where she oddly played a slightly similar role of like the <laughs> scorn, you know, girlfriend or wife or or something, and and who would double cross the other person. But I, I just thought she added a lot of gravitas here, and um, you know, has that really interesting ending as well, where she makes that phone call. Yeah. Um, and her presence uh, is insane, isn't it? She's uh, yeah. obviously she's very tall and very big. Yeah. But her presence exactly. is magnificent on the film and. I love I no visual effects in that sequence, but I love the sequence on the restaurant when they first meet him uh, and the protagonist, her and the protagonist, mm. and and then you know they're talking, and then he does the fight on the kitchen, which is amazing. That fight is just so visceral. He's like picking mm. up pots and stuff and just killing them all, like just like a born supremacy sequence, but to the highest level with that kind of sound power. But that entire sequence is beautiful, the acting on this film, you know, because she's so, so distort and so, so sad. And then she goes to the car and she just goes, wants to go away. And then they force her to stay on the car to see him being beat up. But then he's not beaten up. And then you see the sparkle in her eye and she's like all lifted because she saw that he survived. It's so good, isn't it? She's so good in this film. And also the sequence on the highway when she's trapped inside the car. And she's trying to move out. Really tricky piece of acting there because the camera is so close to her. To her, and you really see how big she is. She's gigantic. She's so so tall. Um, but you know, yeah, good good that you shout out. I think they're all really good. You know, and also like let's let's not forget Kenneth Brabham, which he's such a nice guy, but he's not a nice guy here, is he? 
<laughs> he's such a nice no. guy. He's horrible, isn't he? He's absolutely good horrendous. Baddie. He's, he's horrendous. a good baddie. Now, it's a really yeah. good cast, you know. Of course, John Washington is amazing as a protagonist. I, I think Robert Pattinson steals the show a bit because he's so funny. The way he's dressed, the things he says. And the really funny thing about this is the speculation that is on online that some people think that Michael Caine might actually be the character of Robert Pattinson or it might even be the character of Aaron Taylor Johnson, which is the troop, you know, the, the really funny guy that sometimes says cowboy shit <laughs> so yeah, right. it, which which i they, didn't know that yeah there's a lot of speculation that he might be the reverse version of michael kane because yeah and it's 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 funny to think about those things you know like that they are actually reversed and the same people and as mm. we find out on the film as well that the protagonist is actually the person that invented all of this and on the beginning it's so funny because you you think tenet is an, an operation already existing and they recruit him but actually it was him that invented it it's 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 fascinating. And the more you I see the film, the more is, you understand it, you know? Yeah. yeah. You've, you've got to watch it seven times to work out <laughs> that some of the scenes we're seeing, say when he meets that um, lady who he eventually murders, yeah, um, that that's taking place at a different time. Oh, you're talking about Dimple Ka Ka Kapadia. Yeah, she's really yeah. famous in India. She's a really, really famous yeah. actress. And and I love that sequence as well. Yeah, that's right. Because you think it's her. You think... And also that that is a... I know there's no VFX. Well, there's some cleanup, but that entire sequence in Mumbai when they go up the the, the building and then they he thinks it's the husband, and but then after all, it's her. That's really good. And and the budging jumping, my God, they did it for real as well. They did it for real. And uh, John David Washington, he was so scared as you would be. Imagine if you're doing that. I would shit myself trying to do something like that. You know, trying to budging jump like this. But they did it for real. <laughs> yeah. And the, un the other speculation, I don't think we said this, was that her son is Robert Patterson, right? Oh, okay. Like okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Actually, that makes sense. Damn, this film is so many layers, isn't it? That's insane. That is and insane. don't you hate that Chris Nolan is never going to say... Oh, no. There's no audio never commentary. Gonna... No, no. He never yeah. does audio commentaries. He never really speaks much. He's, at that sense, I, I feel like... No disrespect to Christopher Nolan. I feel like he is basically a little bit like a Kubrick of our time. Uh, you know, I don't want to... He is, of course, a, a, his own genius and his, his own directing. And I'm not saying that he is like that. I think he's amazing and he's, he's separate. But he reminds me of this because Kubrick also didn't say anything at, a, anymore. He never really explained any of these films, just like Christopher Nolan does. And also it feels the same for me because it's Warner Bros. as well, because Warner Bros. was with Kubrick and now Nolan is with Warner Bros. Oh, and right. It feels yeah. a bit similar, this kind of spectacle whenever they did a film, because it is the same feeling when, oh, there's a Kubrick film out, let's go and watch it. The same thing that, oh, there's a Nolan film, which is really special. You know, Not all directors get to do this, where people go to the cinema to watch a Nolan film. They don't go to watch Tenet. They go to, oh, there's a new Nolan film. Oh, there's a new Hitchcock film. Oh, there's a new Kubrick film. There are certain directors that have this power, and Christopher Nolan is one of them, for sure. You know, He's earned that stripe where people don't go for the actors. They go for him. And I think that's an achievement. It's a mind-blowing achievement, especially for someone so young. You know, imagine how many things he's still going to do. You know, because if there is one thing, he's a lot more productive than Kubrick. That's for sure. <laughs> he doesn't take eight years to do a film, <laughs> which yeah. is good. Well, what, and his new film looks, next? yeah, it's Oppenheimer. It looks amazing, isn't it? Uh, the new film. Well, I literally know nothing about it, and I don't think anyone knows anything about it. So well, we know the actors. The we know the actors, and we know you know uh, some returns for from the cast of Batman coming back. And yeah, no, I I can't wait to to watch that film. And I'm sure again that film will probably be an IMAX, and it probably will have a lot of invisible visual effects, and it probably is going to be monumental. I'm sure. I hope he doesn't turn out to do like the. Play. A lot of people were joking online saying. He's done a plane now on Tenet. I'm sure on Oppenheimer, he's just going to make an actual nuclear explosion probably on the film. <laughs> he's actually going to explode for real <laughs> an actual nuclear explosion because you can do a test explosion without radiation. Maybe that's what he's going to do. <laughs> I'm joking. Hugo, on that note, I think we should wrap up. Um, I want to make sure I thank all our patrons again on our Patreons. So Hugo's desk is one Patreon. 
and befores and afters is the other where you can um, uh, sign up and you can actually get to watch the video podcast three days early uh, ad free um, which I think is kind of fun and you can give us all kind of kinds of feedback on it early as well um, so thank you patrons for being part of that yes thank you so much um, yeah Hugo that was a lot of fun I uh, I want to wrap it up by saying I think we should reverse out of here yeah what do you think I think we should let's do it let's do it <laughs> okay <laughs> okay okay